And I was on my way to work one day <clears throat> at an intersection in San Francisco. A laundry truck ran through a stop sign, smashed into my motorcycle, knocked it to the ground, and the petrol cap, the gas cap, popped open and out poured about six or ten liters of petrol, gasoline, all over me, and the heat of the engine ignited it. And I literally became a human bonfire, and I was burned over <clears throat> my hands extensively, as you can see, my, my face, and uh, a bunch of the rest of my body. And were it not for a car salesman who was working in an auto dealership in, on the corner that day who grabbed a fire extinguisher and ran out and put out the flames, uh, my life would have ended right there. There'd be no interview today with you, Warren. And he sat down by my bed, he got my charts, and he said, as of right now, something's going to change in your care. As of right now, I'm putting you in charge of this case. I'm putting you in charge of you. And you're going to call the shots from now on, and no one is going to do anything to you from now on in this hospital that you don't want done. Yeah. Now, I'll go through your chart. I'll look at everything we do in the 24 hours. You tell me what you want stopped. Tell me what you want changed. I'll write the orders. There'll be no discussion, no argument. And we went through all the procedures. And, of course, as your viewers, I'm sure, have surmised, very little of my routine had changed. I kind of liked being alive. I thought that was a good way to be. Yeah. So very little of my routine had changed, but my entire world had changed. Because in that moment, we found a couple things we could do every four hours instead of every three. We found a couple things that we could stop. They were only being done once a day. But in the end, very little in the routine had changed. But my whole world changed in that moment because in that moment, I realized for the first time in my life, really understood it on a personal gut level, it was my choice. Yeah. My life, my choice. For the first time in W. Mitchell's life, Mitchell took responsibility for Mitchell. But people who choose to act as opposed to wait until it's popular, wait until I have more time, wait until when I'm retired. A lot of people like to wait till they're retired to have fun. Yeah, the dreaded R word. And so how about now? I hope we don't wait in life for the big thing to happen as our excuse to change. And yes, you can learn from the past. Yes, you can learn from history. You don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again if it wasn't successful. But to dwell on it, to hang on to it. To, somebody said uh, to me, a, a woman, a friend, a wonderful friend, said to me, it's okay to look back. Just don't stare. Often in life, we... Again, spend so much time whinging, whining, complaining yeah. that we miss all kinds of things. And I've done it, and I, everybody I know has done it. But I wonder whether one single person watching this today can't think of, a, of an experience they had in their life which they would never, ever, ever want to repeat. And yet they would never want to give up the lesson that they got from that experience. And yet sometimes we're so upset about the experience and what that person did wrong that we're forgetting the wonderful gift that they gave us. Maybe not intentionally, maybe they weren't trying to give us a gift, but they gave us the gift anyway. Yeah, yeah. And yet we're still angry at them or angry about the experience, but yet we learned something and got something that changed our life and made our life so much better. And I'd finished all the pilots training that I'd started uh, first in Colorado, then back in California, and and bought an airplane and uh, was just flying high, literally and figuratively. And one morning, took off with four other people in the plane, and something was terribly wrong. As soon as I was off the ground, I realized it, and I aborted the takeoff, pulled the power. The plane stalled. For the non-flyers who are watching today, it doesn't mean that the engine stops running. It literally means that the wings stop flying, and it fell like a rock, smashed back into the ground, and all I could think of was fire and explosion, gasoline was everywhere, and yelled at my passengers, get out. They forced the doors open, and, and I couldn't move. I tried to move. I tried to lift myself. I couldn't figure out what was wrong, and then I started to sense the numbness in my legs and the, 
and the pain in my back and and the ambulance crew came and the paramedics put me on a flight for life aircraft to Denver to the principal city in Colorado where uh, they performed an operation and told me I'd never walk again and I have to use a wheelchair for the rest of my life and I thought that was not fair and why me why does this stuff happen to me and then I learned from our Federal Aviation Administration that I hadn't done the inspection on the plane as carefully as I'd been trained I had violated one of the rules of checking out the plane before you fly it and that contributed to the plane not flying right and <clears throat> but I didn't do it on purpose why me was my question to myself and a few weeks later, a young girl from the little town of Crested Butte, Colorado, called me on the phone and said, Mitchell, I know you're going through a really difficult time, and I, and I know this just has to be unbelievable to you. But about a year ago, you told me something that I'll never forget. I was going through a really tough patch in my life, and you said something that I'll remember forever. You told me that it's not what happens to you. It's what you do about it. She said, do you still believe that, Mitchell? Don't you hate it when people do that to you? I, when the, I like to give advice. I don't like to get advice. Yeah. Don't throw the words back in my face that I just told you. Yeah. And the next morning, for the first time, I asked the orderlies when they came in my room to lift me out of my bed and put me in this new wheelchair, and I hated it. Yeah. I hated it. It was awkward, and it was difficult, and it wasn't where I wanted to be. But every day, I'd get back in the chair, and every day, I went out in the gymnasium, and every day... I learned to do something that I thought was impossible. Mm -hmm. And every day it became a little less bad. And every day it became a little better. And I was getting ready to leave the hospital and go back to my town. And I'd been watching this young guy who had really given up, who had really, his life was over. He just, there was no future left for him. And I was watching him one day and I said, you know something? Before I was paralyzed, there were 10,000 things I could do. Now there are 9,000. Yes, I can spend the rest of my life dwelling on the 1,000 that I lost, or I can concentrate on the 9,000 that are left. And in my lifetime, if I do even a few hundred of those things, I'll be one of the most remarkable people on the planet. It's not what happens to you.